calling all closure beginners. The Clonso is a fun and friendly live call-in show for people starting off on their journey with closure to ask experienced closureians questions and work out problems together. Why do we do this? Well, we want to help you get unstuck. Are you baffled, befuddled, flustered, flummoxed? Having trouble telling your left parentheses from your right? Your conj from your cons? Well, every other Wednesday, we are here to help you out. Who's here to help you out? The Cloudsville core team consists of five developers. Myself, Jordan Miller, AKA Lambda, as a chief Lambda officer. Friend, Paula Giron, the graph whisperer. Another friend, Mike Fikes, who's known to be a self-hosted compiler. Arne Bressor, head of transducing. And of course, our captain of this ship and inspiration for this project, Daniel Hagenbotham. If you follow the QR code on the screen, or you just navigate to thecloundsville.com, you too can give us a question to answer and work through. We will also have a myriad of guests and surprise people joining us. Can't wait to see you there. All right, everybody. Welcome to The Clown Soul, a call-in show for noobs, newbies, and novices on the path to being closure pros. We want to hear from you. Pass us your problems, throw us your code, tell us what has you stumped and befuddled, and we'll make sure to sort it out. Can't tell your left parenthesis from your right, your cons from your cons? Is a transducer something that you would expect to find under your sink? Have no fear. We'll take you from a SOCH to zip map, reducing the ecosystem to exactly the bits you need to know. I'm your host, Clownseller Daniel. And I'm joined today by Clownseller Jordan, who is currently lost in a maze of twisty little nested maps all alike. Clownseller Arna, who has been searching for a matching closing parenthesis, parenthesis since 2007. Clownseller Paula, who surprised the world by being the first bionic lisp interpreter. And Clownseller Mike, whose, crea whose creative use of white space got him an honorable mention in the Vi Venice Biennial. Hold on to your ruffles because the council is in session. So to get us started with our first council session ever, we have a question from Simon Momani, I hope I pronounced that correctly, that I think is relevant for all of us, experienced and novice alike. What is the best way to learn closure? So Ooh. yeah, That's I think <laughs> <laughs> and I think also broadly, you know, it's like how do you how do you learn programming languages in general? And to get us started. I was wondering if Councilor Arna, if you could take a crack at it. Yes, if I manage to unmute my mic. Hello, everyone. So excited to be here. Um, yeah, I guess Simon is not on the call, right? Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm joined. I'm joined. Oh, oh, hello, Simon. Yeah, I so. Not, uh, set my, my computer doesn't have a webcam. That's yeah, you welcome. Can't see my image. That's fine. That's fine. We can hear you fine. Um, okay, so Arna, did you actually learn this language we're talking about <laughs> at some point? Uh, what, 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 this is a Python show, right? Or... Oh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so, Simon, can you t t tell us a, a, a little bit more? Like, so you're you've been learning closure. You've been learning closure, and and. How's it going for you? Do you find it hard? Do you find it hard to find good materials? Okay, uh, I'm Simon Mandela, Mumani from Kenya. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a beginner of uh, closure. Okay, the reason why I asked that question is because I know if you move to a new programming language, especially me, I'm moving from Java. Mm. It is possible for someone to maybe write closure, but closure, but is writing. Uh, Java in closure syntax. So right. I think mm -hmm. so I think uh, I need to be guided on how to learn uh, closure the right way so that I can change my mind how I think and I uh, and the way I approach uh, problems. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um and, and closure is, is particular in that way, I think that um you know, you can, you can, especially if you're already coming from a different language, um, 
you know, writing writing closure and writing like really good idiomatic closure, they're they're kind of two different things, and it, it can be hard to just learn it, you know, from from a book or or from from dry documentation. Um, for that problem in particular, I think if you can, I mean, the best solution for that is really to find someone who has more closure experience who who can mentor you, um, and that's that's you know you have to have that that privilege to have someone around for that. Now that's also why we are here, right? So like, keep coming to the council. We'll be talking about you know what what is idiomatic closure. Um, maybe I can. I don't know if everyone even really knows what what idiomatic means, right? But basically, like, what's what's closure the way that it's sort of meant to be written, or that people that have a lot of experience with closure like like to write it. Um, yeah, that's that's a tough problem. Are uh, reading reading a lot of people's code? uh stuff like that um jordan i don't know what's your take on this um well something you just said that was interesting about um speaking to experience about writing code that is idiomatic because when i first started learning closure i was following um eric norman's tutorials on purely functional.tv and um you know the entry and i was following books and kind of entry level things and um i remember one of my first big you know job interviews like take home assignments um, you know, I wrote it all up and I actually sent it to fellow counselor Paula <laughs> and her, and actually they, I got, I got denied for the job <laughs> for a good, you know, uh, as you should have been, yeah. as I should have been <laughs> because my code was not very idiomatic. And at the time I didn't know what that meant, but a very clear example, um, is I was still using, um, the git function literally instead of using um, you know, I wasn't using destructuring. I wasn't using, um, I wasn't using the things that you see in production applications. It was very clear that my code did not look, it looked like a beginner's code. And so just to like elaborate more on what, on what idiomatic means, I remember being so sad. Like I said, they should have said no to my application because I was using, you know, git, this for map and now you know i don't think that i don't remember the last time i actually used the function git um because i was just you know use hash maps and keywords and but those are the patterns that it's really hard to know and i don't know that there are like blog articles or anything anywhere but that we would like to i don't know help help support um so that's i guess the first first point um the other thing is find something that's fun for you to do you know if you want to learn closure solve a problem in your life that, that, that you're going to stay motivated to, to, to keep, to keep solving, you know, it's, it's, it's not, you don't want it to ever feel like work. And so if you're solving a problem, you, you know, you can feel like your time is, um, I don't know, um, worth, worth more. It's not going to be a challenge to make yourself do it because you want to solve this problem. So that's the other thing I think. I, that's the other bit of advice. I, even if it's something silly, if it's making playlists or you know, and making a to-do list, make make it fun for yourself. Make something for your kid if you have a kid. Um, so the, those are my, um, I guess, responses to that. I have a thought on that. I, I came from a Java background, and for me, the challenge was even just writing code that works. Um, you know, you have you're you're used to writing very imperative loops in Java, and I remember that being a struggle. It's like how. How do you write this algorithm in this functional language and even get it to work? Um, so I wasn't even worried about like writing things properly. Um, if you can even just get it to work, um, I think the all of that other stuff will just come uh, naturally over time, like idiomatic stuff and whatnot. And and maybe it's just like just dive into a REPL and play around and and uh, don't worry so much about like am I doing this right? Because in my, also in my opinion, closure is a very uh, at least the community is a very loose kind of like happy, you know, like there's multiple ways to do things. It's an untyped language, whereas in Java, it's like strict. You got to do it, you know, follow boilerplate, whatnot. So it feels like a much more loose thing to me. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't uh, worry about that, but maybe you are, maybe you want to like do it the right way and, and, and feel like you're, you know, setting yourself up so you're not doing bad habits and whatnot. Uh, I, I, my only thought is like, just read other people's code and the, and the idioms will come to you over time. Mike, it sounds like your response is, you know, step one, join the hippie commune, man. Yeah, Mike. yeah, closer to hippie <laughs> language, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah. Paula. Paula, what's your thinking? Uh, I, 
I'm brought back to when I first learned it. Um, I did start from books myself. Um, and I came through initially watching the SOCP lectures from MIT. And uh, they gave me this new way of thinking about these problems. And then uh, going into other languages like Scala taught me about those immutable um, data structures. And, but Clojure let me bring both those ideas together. And I, uh, <clears throat> I really got going by starting with a closure book. But I do find that, that doing is really necessary, especially to get your head really stuck into those problems. And the small, um, small tasks, simple things which you build up on are really good. So I you don't have to go all the way through them, but I enjoy uh, those types like foreclosure and um, uh, uh, project Euler. Uh, Ian Wood has mentioned Cohen's are good, the closure Cohen's. Um, so smaller problems, which you can do in a, a small amount of time where you think, well, how do I solve that problem? But after getting my first job, because I came in with experience from a different field uh, into that job, I was finding that other people who knew closure were writing much better closure than I was. And I was wondering, how do you get that idiomatic structure to it? And like Mike was saying, reading other people's code really helped me. Uh, I was reading my colleagues. And um, I, uh, I also found that the, the book, uh, The Joy of Closure, which probably was what really cemented the, uh, that what makes something idiomatic in closure uh, and using, yes. That's, <laughs> that's a good that. idea. <clears throat> um, yeah, I think so. Focus is actually uh, here. Sorry. What's that? I think Focus is actually here. Yeah, don't focus want... exists? Yeah. No, he doesn't exist. <laughs> is that a real person? There's no such thing. Yeah. <laughs> Seems like a legendary Pokemon. Anyway, sorry. Go ahead, Paul. Well, the only other thing was that I found that uh, one of the idiomatic things is always try to stick to what's in Closure Core. So reading, just browsing through the functions there, you, mm -hmm. it took me a long time to know most of them. There's probably a few I still don't know, but you know, using those functions a lot really helped make my code much more idiomatic. So you know, trying to use for and reduce and reduce KV and things like this much more often than, um, so, sorry, I meant mat and reduce, uh, as opposed to using for or, or even a loop recur. Sometimes those structures are necessary, but um, more often I find that, uh, uh, that sticking to the core functions really helps me to process data in a way that, that's really natural for closure. I have another thought. Um... You, you may have started with some imperative language. You may have learned like a little bit of Python or something like that. And you're just learning how to do loops and whatnot. And at some point you might get into object oriented programming and that's fundamentally different. Like it takes you a year to get that into your head, right? It's a different way of thinking. And, and a lot of new languages you're like, oh, you're just learning different syntax. Like you've learned C, you moved to Python. It's just a different syntax. And there's a lot more to it than that, but they're all largely the same language. And then you hit like another paradigm like object oriented. And I feel like closure and its functional stuff is a whole different way of thinking. And that's that's the tough thing. You have to get your mind around it. And I don't know if there's a good way to do that. <laughs> you just think deeply sure. about it for a year <laughs> and come out the other end. Yeah, well, so Simon, I'm, I'm curious if like, um, I, I'd love to hear a little bit more about, so you, so you mentioned your, uh, I, think, I think if I understood correctly, you're coming from Java. And, and I think uh, if I heard you said that you are kind of like writing Java in Clojure, which I think is a pretty common thing for, for, for folks. I've definitely seen, seen a fair amount of that myself. I, when I, I came from Ruby, one of my first posts in the Clojure subreddit was just like, so, so like, this seems really cool, but like, where are the objects? How do I, you know? <laughs> um, but so Simon, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit curious to, to hear more about like, um, are there are like specific things that you're struggling with, or that you can you can tell us on a little bit more detail about, like, you know, kind of like where your edge is right now with uh, learning closure? Let 
Right. Going on mute. Or... Uh, hello. Oh, oh, oh. Hey, hey, hello. Oh, 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 okay. I started, first I started learning Java. Mm -hmm. I then enrolled to university to study uh, industrial biochemistry, but I couldn't afford a, a paying school fees. So I decided to I, I decided to take uh, to do something because I dropped from school. So I took a challenge to study Java, but uh, I didn't have a mentor who could take me through. So I've been mm. learning Java for two years. I think I'm good in Java. I can write uh, maintainable, <coughs> maintainable code. But uh, so I like trying new things. So I went and studied uh, Lisp for, I think it was uh, two weeks. And I was very, uh, so this was very good. I, and uh, so I researched about uh, this, this languages that can run in uh, Java virtual machine. So I came across a uh, closure and I said, let me give it a try. So it is a, it has been like two weeks learning uh, closure. I've been trying to run in, on my phone mostly when I have free time. I, I got a, a certain app, it is a ripple, which I've been trying to run closure. But there are many things that come in mind when I try to learn closure. There are many things, for example, how do you implement design pattern? Because I think it's hard. It's something that I've learned in Java, but when I try to see closure, mm -hmm. I see now I'm writing functions that maybe check other functions. Again, now, if I want to implement a single tone pattern, how do I do it? So, so it's something very different. So it has changed my mind the way I think. And uh, I thought maybe I, I used to concentrate on writing code, but now it has changed. I think the most important thing is uh, solving problems. So that's one of the things that Clojure has helped me to change my mind, the way I approach problems. So I have, I, have, I have learned that a programming language is just a tool. Just like the way you learn Excel to solve uh, business, maybe you want to analyze data. The same way you use uh, Java, if you use Clojure, you, you have to, 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 solve, to use it to solve problems. So it's the first time I'm seeing maybe mentors. Uh, this is the first time because I don't even have one friend maybe you can say you can reach out to discuss these things to be called. So it's a pleasure and I think uh, I'll be I'm very glad and uh, I say thank you. Uh, I don't know, I don't I, I don't have to what to say. Like I say, thank you for pleasure. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for your question, Simon, and thanks for the explanation. Um, yeah, I think maybe maybe one thing that I could I could add, like one, it's like it's so exciting to hear about like your 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 closure journey. Um, but uh, one thing that that kind of stuck out, I I remember eventually kind of realizing that a lot of design patterns actually aren't even necessary in closure. Like, uh, like they, they solve they solve problems that just don't exist. Um, when you take this approach of uh, immutable data structures and functional programming, um, because a lot of those design patterns have to do with how do you manage you know mutable state in an object oriented world, you know, <clears throat> and when you don't have that, those problems are just gone. Um, so uh, hopefully, hopefully that's helpful. I'm also curious. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, go a little bit uh, off off script uh, here, as much as uh, we have a script. And and so I saw Pez, uh, you you I, your comment um, it's just profound. You never thought about it. And so uh, totally, I'm, I'm kind of kind of putting you on the spot here a little bit. But I'm just really pleased to to see you here. And I wanted to offer if you wanted to 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 elaborate on that a little bit. Um, you know, what, what you found profound about what Simon was saying. And, and I'm, I'm just curious to hear your thoughts because I know you do so much to help beginners. Yeah, thank you for putting me on the spot. Um, yeah, so what struck me was like, I've been thinking a lot about what do beginners struggle with. And we even have a, like a Slack channel just for that subject. 
and I don't think anyone has even suggested this, that you actually might be looking for something that isn't there. Mm. Like, yeah. how do you solve this design pattern? Because we know I've been using closure for a while, but we, a lot of those, as you said, a lot of those design patterns, we don't, we never reach for them. We don't need them. So, yeah, so, so that was, was profound for me here, just like that revelation that maybe we can help people skip that uh, part uh, like, uh, of, of, the, of the learning curve, just not, instead of, uh, yeah, I don't know how our beginner material could be looked like, but, but just make that clear in, in some mm -hmm. point. You may be looking for some observer pattern here or whatever pattern, and you won't find it because there are other ways. And then that could unblock someone, I guess. Because uh, yeah, it was it was just that. To me, that was like yeah. new, a new perspective. Maybe it's not so much learning, but unlearning. Right. It's a profound thing. <laughs> um, yeah, that no, I, I really love that. It's uh, I, I never thought about that before either. Just like the because like beginners, they don't know what they don't know, right? And they don't. Beginners wouldn't know, like, oh, actually, I don't have to learn design patterns. Um, but Arna, you have you have your your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to add to to that whole conversation that actually, so closure does have most of the affordances that that Nahim, object orientation Nahim, gives you, right? Um, right. We have like we have protocols and, and multi methods and, and you can do like most of the things that, that you can also do in object oriented languages. And sometimes that's that's great. Like there's there are some problems that that really benefit from things like you know polymorphism, type based dispatch. Um, and I think yeah, like, but but if you're coming from a language like Java or other object oriented languages, it's it's this initial unlearning where you're like you know, need to learn that that actually for most problems, there are like other functional solutions, but then there are these few things where actually it's totally appropriate to reach for those like sort of object oriented uh, affordances. Um, so wonderful answers. And thanks, thanks Pez for, for joining us. I'm gonna move us on to our, our next question. And Pez, I'll, I'll go ahead and un, un, unpin you uh, here. Wait, wait, I have a question. I have a question. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Question for the audience. I have a question for the audience. So, um, you know, some of you are here just to see what this is about. Um, some of you are here because you're at the start of your journey with closure. Some of you are just mid level journey and want to join the party. But it would be um, valuable, I think, if we could do like the maybe like a show of hands to kind of see who is coming from maybe they break down like an imperative programming background, a like OOP background and, and whether this is like your first, I know that I'm a weirdo that closure and functional was kind of my first foray into programming, but it would be interesting to see um, down at the bottom of the Zoom, there are these reactions where you can like raise your hand um, and maybe we'll just do like, if you come from an imperative background, do a clap. If you come from like an OO background, do a thumbs up. And if um, closure and functional program is like you're, you're kind of the beginning of your foray, or maybe you start with JavaScript that's a little bit functional and you, now you're going to closure, the closure script, then you can do heart. But it would be cool to see the different um, backgrounds of people here if we don't mind. Yeah, this is this is exciting. Wow, we've got some hearts in there. Yeah. And yeah. They, they disappear fairly quickly, so you might have to do it again to make sure we can count you. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta write a program to keep track of this. Well, <clears throat> uh, Captain like called out like uh, six, uh, seven thumbs up, uh, four hearts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this yeah, is yeah, just a cool. casual, just kind of looking yeah. around the room. To, you so, know, so see. oh, oh, it does seem to dominate, but there are some people who just straight up went for the functional, which is great. And, and, and of course, you know, with the console, we hope to, you know, yeah. encourage that and see more of those in the future. Yeah, for sure. Uh, also, you know, uh, 
yeah, congrats to the, the people starting with Clojure, but then also like, hope you don't have to go to another language because it's, <laughs> it's oh. gonna ru ruin it for you. <laughs> well, maybe maybe one day yeah. there's gonna be something that's even better. Yeah, maybe maybe one day. Well, I had a fantastic experience starting with Clojure in the community, and, and I think I would have had an even better experience if I had a resource like this, the Council. So uh, you know, if this is or this was. Um, congratulations, glad you're here. Cool, good to see you. We want to see more of you. And you may hear some naysayers, but just kind of like those hot thoughts in your head, just like mash them down and, and <laughs> listen, you know, see that they're there. But yeah. you know, it can be it can be motivating. So we're well, we would like to see you stay. Is um and you did the first step by coming to the meeting. So that's awesome. That's it. Okay, back to you, back to you, Daniel. <laughs> All right, cool. Yeah, hopefully I didn't sound like, oh my god, hope you don't have to go to another language. Uh, uh, anywho, so the next question that we have is from, uh, let's see here. Uh, okay, our next question is from Michael Nardell. And let's see if Michael is on, on the call. Uh, yes, I, I believe Michael is. Uh, Mike, or is it Michael or, or Mike? Um, would you like to ask, ask us your question about still navigating steel libraries and, you know, it's, um, to, you know, say hello. <laughs> yeah, hi. This this is great, and uh, I I um, I also on the point of learning Lisp and then having to deal with other languages. I I, I wonder if it's sort of like uh, uh, that. What is it? Uh, the character from is it Moliere uh, who who realizes uh, he had been speaking prose his whole life. I wonder if it's like you know with the you when you in other program languages you realize you've been speaking Lisp your your whole programming journey, right? Because everything is sort of a, an abstract, you know, it's really just programming to the abstract syntax tree, which Lisp makes real. But anyways, uh, on, on so for me, uh, uh, <clears throat> I, I consider myself okay with the, the language maybe, uh, but, but I get really, Whenever I have to load in uh, some library, there's a part of me that just gets a little, uh, a little uh, procrastination sets in, and I'm just not really up for it. Uh, I had a fairly recent experience of looking at some of the HTML parsing libraries, and uh, I, I looked at. I think I originally looked at. Uh, I, uh, um, I, I is it uh, CLJ tag soup. And it looked kind of nice to work with. I liked the sort of look of it as being sort of lightweight, but I realized it was a, a little bit old, but it's still, you know, again, I, I really like that approach and closure that, you know, just because something uh, hasn't been touched in a while, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. But then I tried to sort of load it in, uh, you know, did a like a, you know, set up a project. And I think I put, it correctly in my uh, it the, put the uh, uh, I found the place in Clojars where the where it told me what dependency I should put in my project and it it, it still broke and I was kind of wondering like how more you know first of all how more experienced closure programmers confront the challenges of working with a a, a library that you need to load um, how what do you do I mean if you kind of like the look of a library do you ever consider uh, 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 that, but where you're running into problems, do you ever consider um, get uh, get it? You know, instead of working with the the jar, uh, uh, working with the source code and and updating it to get it to work, um, and just how you you know how you confront that problem. And again, I, I don't know if I mentioned this beginning. In the end, I just sort of switched to using Hickory, and that seems to work. And was you know kind of the the project. Uh, didn't stall out because of this. It stalled out because of you know other. I, I still need to keep on working on this thing, but it didn't. It wasn't a roadblock for me. But I'm kind of interested in how more experienced pro uh, closure programmers confront the issue of there's a library out there. It's a little bit old and it's not working right out of the gate. Uh, that is that uh, uh, enough to for the group to work with? Uh, um, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, thanks. Really appreciate the, the question. Like I've, I've run into this uh, actually somewhat recently too in a kind of gnarly way. Um, but uh, why don't we have Paul, uh, Councillor Paula, wanna uh, take a first shot? Sure. Um, I've had this happen a few times. Uh, I think initially I would look at the code and work, try to work through it myself. 
which is not the right approach. <laughs> the right approach is to go to the community and ask. Um, Closurian Slack often has people there who can answer your question. And many times what I thought was something failing was really just me um, not knowing that I should have approached something a particular way. Uh, but that doesn't always work. Um, sometimes something has become stale for whatever reason, or there was a bug in it in the first place. Um, I think the majority of people I know would then move on and look for another library. Um, that's not me. I normally want to go in and have a look. And the beauty of closure code is that it's usually terse. Um, things are in you know, not spread over a dozen classes with lots of functions, that, methods, sorry, that you have to delve into, but usually things are uh, a lot more uh, localized and easier to figure out what's going wrong and why, uh, in which case I will frequently um, find what doesn't work for me, patch it, and get that going, in which case I will um, uh, do a PR for the original project or I and as sometimes happens where people aren't responsive there uh, I'll fork and then put the dependency on my own fork um, so yeah uh, I, I think there's a, a few different steps the first is to speak to people who've used it who know it um, and when that doesn't satisfy I, I like to get in there and, and work with it um, and sometimes just by asking the question, another person will get in there and work with it. And uh, it's sometimes funny just how quickly another person wants to show that they can they can do something well, and they'll have uh, they'll have the solution for you really quickly. Um, so I'm personally I'm not scared to get into those libraries, and I really I like that opportunity to look at at something else like that. Anne, I believe you wanted to respond. Do um, yeah, thank you so much for for this question and for elaborating. Um, so, I, I, there's there's I want to say some stuff in general about sort of looking at ev and evaluating libraries, but then also you you mentioned specifically that that you were uh, dealing with CLJ TechSoup, and so I, I went and had a quick look at their at their GitHub and and. Kind of want to want to say a few things about how you know how I look at a, at a project like that. Um, so, in general, I like you know, you you know you have a problem you need to solve. You know you need to find an HTML parsing library. Okay, you know, I would probably also just if I don't already have something that that I've seen around or that I think might be a good fit, I you know, I Google, start looking at a couple things, kind of skim the read me. It's like okay, this this one looks promising. And then just try to get it into a REPL, right? Like that's try to get to that REPL as soon as possible. And if if I don't have something running and sort of like can I evaluate some examples from the README within the next 10, 15 minutes, um, I would quite likely try the next one. And maybe I'll I'll revisit it again if it if it did look promising, you know, but sort of like that that to me, like don't don't spend too much time on on projects that that are not really maintained or don't have good documentation because there's quite likely uh, something else out there, especially for, for such a common problem. Um, now, in this case, so I, I had a look at um, CLJ Tag Soup and the last commit is from 2020, which is not, you know, not, not last month, but it's not, it could be worse. Like that doesn't seem that bad. But then when I click, click through to Clojars, um, I immediately noticed that the last release is from 2012. Um, and so that that sets off some that's some warning signs, right? Like so that that probably means that the 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 author of this library, they've they've been getting some pull requests, they probably still merged some pull requests, but maybe they're not really using the library themselves anymore. They've never actually made the effort to put out a new release. Um, and when you go look, you know, there's a couple open pull requests. I don't know how old they are. There's uh, 10 open issues. Um, yeah, there's like an open pull request from 2011 and from 2019. It's like, yeah, this project is probably not very actively maintained. And then it might be that someone actually has gone and forked it and put out their own version on Clojars that maybe works fine 
but but again you know like you kind of need to see like is there really then not like a better maintained alternative sometimes i will say okay you know like i really like what this person was doing but they just kind of stopped doing it but i but i want to build on it and just just fork it myself this has become much easier with depth seed and you know you can just load stuff from from github directly um but you know that's not that should not be your first reaction and and yeah if it's if it's too hard like ask as Paul said ask the community you know like should i be putting so much effort is there not is there not an easier way because usually there is i want to i want to check in um that's a really great answer i want i want to check in uh michael so you know we've mentioned using depths eden i know you had a, another question as well about kind of like reading depths eden and project.clj and so when we talk about like oh you can actually just use um git uh you know a, a library with like github or you know git directly using dev speed and I'm, I'm, i want to check and see if that um if you, you know what we're talking about with that or we can also like kind of dive a little bit more into depth speed yeah. project uh, yeah thank, thanks for bringing that up but i think yeah that that was sort of my other that kind of i've heard that mentioned but that with get you know, um, depth seed and you can just sort of go directly to, but I haven't done that in practice. Like I was sort of like, oh, I'll have to try that sometime. But, you know, honestly, like a lot of things uh, that hasn't, that's not really in my, it, I don't have experience with that. And so I think it's just one of those things I have to try it out and to get the feel for it. Um, but, but I think that's sort of, and I think that's the area where I'm, I'm, where my learning process is in closure is to try out some of these things that are more, in in getting familiarity with how to work with the tooling and 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 whatnot and uh, so sort of and trying to carve out some time for that but but uh, I, I I would yeah I, I appreciate kind of considering that that other part of my question so um, uh, that that is an area where I I don't have comfort I, I'm not really comfortable right now so I um, would be happy to have a, a little bit more discussion on that. What do you say, Council? Want to talk Jordan, about Jordan? Some... Jordan seems to have her hand up. What's what's your th what's your thinking, Jordan? Well, um, and I noticed that you can't really see with all the craziness back there. It's hard to see the hand up. So, um, oh, I would say I apologize, but I don't. Um, <laughs> so you should. The, the beautiful thing I think about um, closure depths and the, and in project files is that they're just data, and you can kind of consume them in the way that you want. Um, you can do like line build the thing and it kind of does a lot. It kind of builds all of it for you. You don't need, really need to worry about that in the beginning. Um, but I remember a, a beautiful step in my, in my journey was this, this leap I made from when I was always um, cloning projects, cloning, forking, in, in duplicating templates that I saw. And the clarity that I can just make a new file and call it devs.eden and open a hash map and look at the documentation and put in whatever I want. And the freedom that comes with that is like, I just remember that was such a uh, important step in, in my in my learning journey. And um, I guess I also wanna mention that there is a great talk um, by Alex Miller at the Closure Conj a couple of years ago, it's called Composable Tools. Um, and so between that talk and then, which is a really great reference, if you do wanna dive into Depths Eden, um, but I guess I'd like to mention that you don't you don't have to, you know. It's one of those things that some developers you configure it once, or you do line, or you use, you just have a preference for line, and then you, um, you know, don't you just kind of copy. I know lots of really advanced closure developers that always just copy their former templates, like you know, um, their or copy their former um, depth email, you know, all their all their tooling files. They just copy it over and they don't worry about it because they have it figured out and that's it. And you can do it that way. Um, whenever you're ready to dive into it, I think the tooling is something really fun because you, you gain this clarity that, you know, uh, the code is just data and it's, it's, it's really neat to get to that point and that understanding. Um, but you don't need to feel well, pressure to, well, um, so yeah, I guess that's my, uh, I well, had, had, had a whole complicated metaphor about clocks, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave that. <laughs> Um, does that, does that satisfy, I mean, I, I'd like to give the, the rest of the concerts, um, an opportunity to answer the, the question, but, um, Michael, did that, 
uh, accurate, satisfied? Was that a satisfactory? Yeah, that, that's answer? great. I mean, that, that helps me know, know that I'm not, you know, way out of step. Um, but I think I'm sort of at that point too, where like, like you suggested, you get a lot of benefit from going in and looking at it and saying, oh, what, what does this mean? And what, what is this doing for me? And, you know, is this, you know, is this just old craft that I should remove or, or is this actually, you know, uh, doing something in, uh, for me right now? So, so, um, and again, I think I, I'm making that tra transition from, you know, again, I, I got started, I think with, with, with line and, and I would just, you know, line new, some my project and and was very you know kind of but kind of more or less ignored the everything besides maybe the dependencies in the in in the uh, project CLJ. Um, now I'm trying to again I, I really uh, uh, trying to make that transition to depths.eden and and learning learning from it. But I think it's one of those things where I I probably just need to take some time and just. A relaxed in a relaxed way read read through things and and get a feel for it and i think you know i think in some respects what i think i need to do is instead of trying to have the minimal amount of configuration and tooling to do some work i'm i'm trying to do some maybe get the a minimal amount of code <laughs> that will let me explore uh both configuration and tooling so where I, instead of changing my focus from the 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 code I'm working on to the tooling and configuration and seeing and playing with that as opposed to, I, I just want to get it to work and I want to forget about it after I get it, get it, get it working. Um, so yeah, I really appreciate the discussion. And the great thing is the, is that um, once you, once you do get it, depths Eden is actually so much easier. My, my personal opinion that once it clicks, like I said, it's just that moment of like, I can just, make a file and call it depths Eden. And it just, and it, I just make a hash map and pass in, fill in the blanks. And it's like, wow, that was easy. That was cool. Once, once you, once you figure it out, it's a lot easier, but you know, there's never a requirement to figure it out. Do what makes, what's going to motivate you to do more, you know, is really what it is. So um, I know that uh, Arna oh, has. So, so actually, yeah. yeah. So Jordan, I know, yeah, Arna and, and Mike, I know like, uh, um, but actually, we have Alex Miller uh, himself on, on the call, and I wanted to give Alex a chance to, to talk about uh, Depths Eden a little bit. Um, Alex, if you'd like to do that, thanks for, thanks for being here. Let me add you to the spotlight. All right. Woohoo! <laughs> Hello, Hello, Alex. Hello, Alex. <laughs> Hello everyone. <laughs> Howdy. <laughs> no pressure. Um, thanks for coming on. So yeah, Depths Eden, the idea behind Depths Eden when we first started looking at it was that one of the big downsides that we saw in a lot of existing, um, uh, you know, the existing tools, both Java and other things is that um, the dependencies are effectively buried inside of code, not, and they're not data. And so being a good closure, be, being good closure people, we wanted this stuff that was data to be data. So <laughs> that was the original motivation is, uh, can we just declare dependencies as data in an Eden file um, and then use that to drive everything else? So um, so the depths.eden file is, as Jordan said, just a, a closure map. And it has uh, a handful of top level keys. The main one for dependencies is depths. And then that's just a map from library to coordinate. And libraries are always fully qualified symbols, uh, which match the, um, the group and artifact ID. Uh, and then the coordinate uh, is sort of an open system. Uh, inside tools depths, the library underneath depths Eden, um, that actually is an open system. There's, there's a handful of different depth types that are supported there, Maven, obviously, uh, and then Git depths is another one, which, um, so another observation we made is that um, Clojure is the source-based language primarily. Um, we don't typically compile libraries and distribute them as compiled code, we distribute them as source code. And so there's no reason that we, as, as you know, developers living in this ecosystem, we should not have to um, take our closure source files, which are perfectly good as they are, make them into 
jar artifacts, push them up to the Maven cloud, pull them down from the Maven cloud, put them on the, <laughs> put them on the class path, and then use them as uh, go through all that when we can just include those source files directly. And so, um, so the closure CLI and the depth seed and, um, give you the ability to just point at the actual closure source file code that's already in the git dep, <laughs> that's already in the git repo or, or even a local directory that happens to have some closure source code in it. Um, and there is definitely a time and a place and a reason for artifacts, but, um, we should not be, we should not be constrained by this Maven Java centric view of the world when we don't need that for closure. So that's the idea behind that. That's a that's a wonderful explanation, Alex. Thanks for thanks for sharing that, and thanks for for being here. Um, let's see here. Love to see closure. <laughs> yeah, off topic question: Are Alex and Jordan related? Want to want to feel that? I will answer this question in the chat. No, we're not. Miller is just oh, a man. common last name. Oh. <laughs> Alex has been. Uh, good I like to say we're all related, so don't cross any of us because we're out to get you. Yeah. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> no, we're not. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've always wondered if anybody was gonna eventually ask that, but I guess it, I guess, guess it happened anyway. It finally happened. <laughs> it finally happened. Yeah. Well, that was that was that was great. Um, so I'll go ahead and remove y'all from spot. Well, uh, spotlight. But well, I guess Michael just want to check. Uh, before I remove you too, to see like uh, how how was that for you? It, this is great. I mean, I really uh, for you know again, it's sort of hearing some stuff that's maybe didn't quite click, and I, I think I'm and I think really just that idea of just try it out and experiment with it, and there there you know is the way it's yeah it's what I need to do. Um, so I appreciate the the support in doing in that approach. Um, awesome. Just, great. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thank, thanks again for asking your question. Um, yeah, that was a really fun discussion. Uh, yeah, it's funny because like, I feel like all this stuff, it keeps, it keeps evolving. And it's like, even for myself, sometimes I don't like, it took me a while to get on the depths Eden train and like everyone else. I'm like, once I started doing it, I'm like, okay, this is the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's like, yeah, you, you balance that with like, you know, you want to get stuff done and you don't, you know, taking time to figure stuff out, it's, you know, it can, well, it takes time and work, but, um, you know, but uh, yeah, definitely with depth Eden, it's, it's worth it. Um, oh, all right. Uh, so we're going to keep things oh, rolling. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Jordan. One more thing. One more thing. One more thing. Sorry. Um, I like, I think it's important to sit like learning is like layers of an onion, right? Every time you, the first time you hear something or learn it, you're exposed to it. You're like, what the frick? Like you don't, and the second time you hear it, it like makes a little bit more sense. And I would like to say, so I was at the con a couple of years ago when Alex gave his talk on depth.eden and uh, I didn't get it. I was just revealed that like, it was so early in my journey that yeah. like, I tried to get it. Like I took notes on it as though I got it. But my I reaction didn't... was like, why another tool? Why are you <laughs> yeah, I, didn't, yeah, I didn't get it either. I yeah, <laughs> I didn't. I like I was so early in my closure journey that like I didn't even understand the need for you know I <laughs> nothing made any sense but like through repeated exposure in conversations like this and getting involved on like a silly that is like Twitter and watching the talks again um it's just so you know don't don't be I think it's important that you said that you're like oh it hasn't clicked yet but it will and then when it does click, it'll be so, so great for you. But yeah, I, did, I would like to mention that the first time I saw that talk, it was right over, right over my head and that was years ago. And now I'm, you know, all, like prophesizing, you know, I'm like depths eaten or die. Like, <laughs> so, okay, yeah. okay, I'm done now, yeah, yeah. I'm done now, I'm mute, mute. Try, try depths eaten from your cold dead hands. It's like, yeah. Uh, oh, I wanted to mention, so I wrote in, um, one of the things that has me thinking about, and I'll be just mention this briefly, is just like oftentimes I think when you're learning a, a language, it's it's um, you, you might be unsure about like what part of the language you're learning, right? And so what what I mean by that is like there's the syntax, but then there's also like the paradigm or the way of thinking about it, but then there's also the build tools, right? 
And I actually read a little blog post about this a while, like a while back of like different, different uh, techniques or tools for learning languages. And like one of them is just like, um, if you find yourself like really struggling, taking the time to like step back and identify, like being able to identify like where actually, you know, um, am I struggling with, with uh, this language? Right. So anyway, just thought I'd share that. Um, and uh, we got we got about ten minutes left here, and I wanted us to play a game called Worst Answer. And uh, <laughs> so 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 I think we could do this. We could revisit the first question: best way to learn closure. And I want to hear y'all's worst answers for the best way to learn closure. Uh, and uh, audience, feel free to raise your hand. I suppose on this one. Yeah, or even uh, I'd say just, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, feel free to unmute yourself and give us your worst answers. I think when you go to sleep at night, you take the books with you into bed with you and you sleep on top of them. And by <laughs> osmosis, you will learn it. <laughs> yeah, you got to sleep right. on it. Yeah, literally sleep, sleep on, on it. it. Yeah. All right, worst answer. I want a worst answer. Yeah, What's that can be worse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Michael. Uh, uh, first, you need to learn category theory, right? Ah, yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. Study <laughs> macros one. first. Yeah. Macros, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, start with macros. What's the worst, worst answer? Earlier, I think earlier. I think you, you, heard... you, you, take, you take a piece of paper and you basically practice writing parentheses like for yeah. hours on end <laughs> until you actually absolutely <laughs> nail it. And make them balance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah there you go. Like write love princesses. letters, yeah. love letters to Rich Hickey, and then sit outside of his house with a boombox. Yeah. <laughs> say, I love you, yeah. Rich. <laughs> I love you, Rich. <laughs> yeah, classic, classic learning. Oh, we're not supposed to do that. Yeah, oh. underrated. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Worst answer. We got some. We have some worst answers here. Yeah. <laughs> Alex Miller says that's how I got this job. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Yeah, I have. Uh, so one one of the things I did was I, you know, I gathered some friends and we formed a seance to to summon up. Uh, hmm. uh, <clears throat> oh God, I'm blanking on the guy's name who invented, who invented, you know, created list. Yeah, John McCarthy. McCarthy. John McCarthy. Yeah. Oh, okay. Seance. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did he visit you? So, <laughs> yeah. He did. It was fun. He did. He tell Best. you you're doing it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> He's a nice guy. Worst okay. and best, start with Emacs. That's a great one. Oh, yeah. That's a good, good man. Start with Emacs, yes. Yeah. That's... Yeah. I feel like I should apologize there. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I've seen, I've seen that go wrong. Uh, well, yeah. if you really, if you want to learn the language, you've got to really understand it. So I think you should probably re implement it from scratch in Postgres. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> did, Not did you say? Sorry, I meant to say Postscript. Postscript. Uh, no, I like Postscript is during complete, so you could re-implement closure in Postscript. Once you finish that, I'm sure you'll you'll fully understand the language. And, well, and, and also you need to understand the, the complete history behind it. So I think you need to start with McCarthy's original paper, and mm -hmm. then you know learn Lisp one, and then basically every Lisp since then, you know, like until you get eventually to closure. Then you paid your dues. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hot <laughs> take. Kind of best way to learn closure. Best way to learn closure is cl is to learn closure script. Hot take. <laughs> and I'm not even kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, dealing with shadow right. Eden stuff is what made urged pushed me into understanding the build, the configuration, build configuration, like having to work with multiple okay. layers of Eden files is what like made me have to learn that. So um Speaking of Shadow CLJS, we had a question about testing on Shadow CLJS, and and Daniel, I don't know if we can really like get really get into it anymore, but um, I did prepare a little bit of code for for that person, Scott, I believe. Is Scott around? I don't see him in the participant list, but yeah, if you want to share that, um, um I mean, I'll I'll post it in the Slack because I, I was kind of hoping to ask them. Uh, a little bit more about you know what exactly they're struggling with. Their question was, um, I can read it. Getting back into CLJS after a long break, can find a write-up. Um, now 
I'm messing with my, okay. Can't find a writer that shows how to configure a CLGS repo for unit testing in Shadow CLGS in 2022. So um, yeah, I basically followed the, the Shadow documentation and set up two mini toy projects, one with browser-based tests, one with node-based tests. I shared that in the Slack repo. Um, yeah, I was, was really hoping to ask some more questions about what exactly they're struggling with. There's a lot more I can say to that, but I think we'll just, We'll just leave it there. If anyone else faces similar problems, you know, of course, hit our uh, form on the website, uh, send in, you know, what you're struggling with, and then maybe next time we can actually get into it. I think that that's a great segue, mentioning the website and the form, and we've got about five minutes left, and uh, so I think that's a great segue actually to start winding things, winding things down here. It's already been almost an hour. Uh, I've had a, a great time, and one of the ways, that, well, the way that we want to uh, end these shows is what we're, we're calling picks, and so all the counselors will just share some of their picks, life picks. It doesn't have to be programming, doesn't have to be closure, but just things that they, they want to share. So, um, uh, Mike, would you want to kick that off? Oh, okay. Well, so one thing I, I'm stupid, and I, it took me so long to realize doing electronic stuff, that one thing that you need when you're doing this garbage can to throw your junk into. Otherwise, it just piles up on the board. And it took me like months to figure this out. <laughs> so that's my pick. Get a pail to throw your, your garbage into. I recommend it thoroughly. That's a great suggestion. <laughs> yes. I truly didn't figure that out for so long. <laughs> Robert says, Robert says, says. Out box. yes, exactly. <laughs> Mike, you want to hand it to the next picker? Oh, how about Jordan? I don't know if I can talk anymore. Okay, actually, so y'all always see me drinking out of this cup, right? And everyone's like, it's probably coffee because that's what everybody drinks. I don't like coffee or chocolate, actually. I just Or tannins, that whatever. I just don't <laughs> like the taste of it. Um, but I still need caffeine, right? So um, I make my own, um, I guess, I guess to be called energy drinks. I buy li liquid caffeine on Amazon. And then I do like a splash of juice. And then I do like, a, I have a soda stream that I make my own soda water. And that's what I'm always drinking out of my cup. And it's like, that I don't know. Things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's cheap and I can like measure how much caffeine I want too, like very, very measurably. And um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it's my jam. I, I highly, highly recommend it cool. as a caffeine alternative, I guess. I don't know. Um, that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's my bit that and cats highly recommend cats as a <laughs> concept. <laughs> I will pass this over to Paula. Um, I don't know what I would pick. Um, the, a couple of years ago now, two and a half years ago, um, Stu Holloway gave a talk at Closure Conch about, uh, how, Sherlock Holmes was the, um, uh, the greatest developer ever and went through all of the habits that um, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle wrote about Sherlock Holmes and how these related to being a, an effective developer. And one of them was that uh, he always took notes through, uh, through his investigations. And consequently, this is my, <laughs> I've just started a new notebook, mm -hmm. but, um, my daughter gave me this and, and um, uh, decorated it for me. Uh, notes are really effective, but the thing that really drilled it home to me was if you need to um, compare the way you, you remember something, because many people say, I don't need to, do, to take notes because I've got a great memory. Um, just consider how well your memory is going to compare against the next person who did take notes how effective uh, is your memory up against that? And I have been pleasantly surprised on occasion when I browse back through my notes to discover things that I had completely forgotten about. Um, it's been a really valuable tool, not only for remembering things, but also for helping me order my thoughts because that time taken to, uh, to convert my ideas into words through the pen uh, really, um 
helps me structure my thoughts much better than they had existed up to that point, even though I thought I had a good grasp of what I was thinking on. So that's my pick, a notebook. Mm -hmm. It's a great pick. Who do you want to pick to go next? <laughs> it's me and Arna. Sorry, yeah, I know, I know. Um, I'll go, Anna. Oh, thank this you. This is the day. <laughs> um, okay, yeah. So I have I have two picks: a, a closure pick and a non-closure pick. Um, my closure pick is Portal. Um, actually, yeah. You raise your hand. Use any of the emoji reactions if if uh, you've already used Portal. Um, people in the in the chat. Um, so Portal is. Uh, 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 basically a, a library you added to your project and it gives you this this UI that you can send values to from your REPL or from, from any function that's evaluating and you can drill down into it. And it, it like basic, as a basic data exploration tool, it's already fantastic, but it has a lot of like more power user features as well. It's It's been getting better and better. I uh, really like what they're doing with that. So um, pretty much added to almost every project these days. Uh, it's by uh, someone who goes by the name DJ Blue, DJ Blue Portal. You can look that up. Yeah, Jordan uh, shared the, the link in the chat. And then my other um, pick is uh, a Minecraft pick. Um, so thanks to Clojure uh, and thanks to my uh, to, to be teenage nephews, um, I got into Minecraft, started with just coding Minecraft, but then I also, also just kind of got sucked in and started playing Minecraft more and more. Um, and the thing with Minecraft is that like it's it's this galaxy of its own that people have been playing for 10 years. And so it feels like everyone who's sort of like somewhat into the game already knows everything and you know nothing. Mm. Like it's like, you know, where do you even I guess it's like similar to like starting to learn closures, like all these things that people are referencing, like where do you even start learning about this stuff? And so um, way too late, I, I learned about this YouTuber called Pixel Riffs, uh, and he makes this Minecraft survival guide. Um, and like, I wish this guy made um, tech tutorials because he's so good at explaining stuff and he really starts from zero. It's like, okay, you know, how does the coordinate system work? How does the world work? What are entities? Like really from, you know, from zero to, and then step-by-step step, all the different mechanics in the game. Um, and so, yeah, that's called the Minecraft survival guide. Uh, he's on to a season two now. Um, and so if like me, you also want to do some coding with Clojure and Minecraft, uh, and, and for that, you need to understand the game a little bit, then that's also extremely helpful. So that's my second pick. And uh, then I'll pass it on to Daniel. All right. Yeah, so I, I have a couple picks. Um, my first one, non-closure, is... Uh... a. <laughs> This mug, I think it's beautiful. I love it. It's made by a local potter. Her name is Dolores Farmer. And I'll link to her website, Dolores Pottery. Um, yeah, I think she does beautiful work. <clears throat> and uh, my second pick is something that I don't think has gotten too much attention. This is a closure pick. And it's this library, Receif. And the idea with Receif is that it's a, it's a, it's a kind of like a, a wrapper on top of TLA+, which is a tool for specifying systems um, created by Leslie Lamport, who basically invented distributed programming. And uh, so TLA plus is kind of like gnarly and it's kind of difficult to, 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 to learn, but um, I've used, I used receive recently and being able to actually specify systems, meaning you, you, you specify like, um, Basically, your your uh, a distributed it doesn't have to be distributed, but a system as a state machine, saying like, you know, here are the states, and then like here are the state transitions, but in a way that um, makes it possible for you to kind of check check your logic to be like it. So it's very uh, handy for distributed systems where you can run into all kinds of problems. Um, but you know, uh, this tool like TLA plus. Uh, it, it explores really like the whole space of possible orderings of, of actions within your system. So if you, you can see if you can get into an invalid state. And receive is just beautiful because now you get to do this with closure. And I find, I found that it was actually like made what I was doing so much easier to understand and also easier to write. So um, I, I believe that he, I think he, he links to like a YouTube talk that he's done 
but I was just like, just really, this tool like has really uh, improved my life. So wanna promote it as much as possible. Uh, Daniel, is it also useful for protocols? For, for protocols? Um, <clears throat> Possibly, um, could you could you say a little bit more? I mean, I'm not like Def Protocol, but uh, you know, you have a thing that talks to another thing, and it sends a handshake, and then it sends an ID, and then it sends back the data, and then it sends back a timestamp, and then it sends back a timeout. You know, it, it, those can get complicated super fast. For uh, sure, yes, yeah, that is the kind of thing that it is made for. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah, great question. Yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah, so in, in general, super good tool for distributed systems, which are very gnarly and difficult, that can be difficult to work with. And this can make it a lot easier for you to kind of look out your logic and verify that it's correct. Uh, and I think that that's it for the final, well, for the picks segment of our show. And to, to, to end things, I think Arna is going to share something with us. So pass it on to you, Arna. Yeah, so I'm, I'm taking my mask off for this because this is um, unfortunately not a, not a lighthearted topic. Um, yeah, so we, we, with the class, we're trying to create a, a supportive environment for, for newcomers. Uh, and part of how we're trying to do that is, is by creating a fun and lighthearted atmosphere. Um, but uh, the, the last part we want to touch upon uh, comes from a, a deeper place of care for our fellow humans. Um, and yeah, we wanna we wanna highlight some ways uh, in which we can help other people and and use use the platform that we have here um, to sort of take our, our social responsibility. So, um, as as I suppose most of you are well aware, uh, tomorrow it will be one month since Russia invaded Ukraine and started a, a brutal and bloody conflict. And I know a lot of us feel deeply affected by what's happening. Um, I mean, I'm sitting here in Berlin, and it, it's not that far from here, honestly. Um, and, you know, there's uh, a, a lot of closure folks uh, in and, and from Ukraine, like we as a community are also deeply connected, I think, with, with what's happening there. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I've, I've done some looking around and, and try to find some reliable charities um, that, that I could sort of you know, with with a good conscience, uh, suggest people donate to 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 help a little bit relieve some of the suffering that's happening. Uh, these are all uh, legitimate, reliable organizations that have real local connections. So they're not some some outside NGO that flies in, but they're you know people on the ground that have the networks that have the connections that know where, where the help is needed. And I'll be sharing the details of these and, and the links uh, in the chat as well uh, on, uh, on Clojurians. So the first is um, Caritas Ukraine, which has provided shelter, food, and more to over 100,000 people since the war began. Uh, and they have a number of options for transferring money on their website. Um, then there's Razom, um, which I thought was really interesting, is an organization created by the Ukrainian diaspora uh, after the 2014 annexation of Crimea. And they send over 70 pallets of hospital supplies and medicine to Ukraine every single week uh, through a distribution center in Poland. So they source this stuff in the West and then um, get it in there where it's needed. Um, and they accept donations via credit card or PayPal. Um, and then there's people in need. This is actually a, a Czech char charity, um, but they supply a lot of aid to Ukraine They've already sent thousands of pallets of food, blankets, hygiene supplies, and operating kits to many hard hit and hard to reach areas. Uh, and they take credit card or IBAN payments, especially interesting for European people, I think. Um, and then uh, I'll list, link to an article with, with more links uh, set up by the Center of High Impact Philanthropy of Penn University. Um, this is every, every link in there is, is vetted, is legit, and, and is gonna have impact. Um, so I just wanted to share that and, and you know, hope that uh, some people feel moved to, to help out a little bit more. Um, I'm also, uh, and this is still a little bit um, to be determined, but I'm, I'm talking to some companies in the closure space um, to see if we can maybe set up some matching funds. So basically making it possible 
uh, if people donate and send in their receipts that we can double their donations. Uh, and so my company, Gaiwan, is, is, uh, will contribute a little bit to that. There's some other companies here in, in Berlin that I've already talked to that are interested. Um, if you're on the call uh, and, and you think your company might be interested in, in helping out with it or just curious and want to hear more, uh, yeah, feel, feel uh, happy to, to reach out to me directly. Um, so, yeah, that's it. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a little bit of a different note to end on. Um, but yeah, we, we did think it, it was important to, to recognize that, that, you know, despite we can, you know, all the fun that we can still have, this, this is still happening and, and there are things that we can do. Um, so yeah, that's, that's it for me, Daniel. Yeah, thanks a lot, Arna. <clears throat> thanks very much for, for sharing that info. And um, just wanted to say thanks to everyone on the call too for joining us for our, our very first council session. It's definitely, uh, means a lot to me for us to be able to, to to gather like this and to have a good time and to uh, not just have have a good time but then also like help each other learn and grow and help each other in more significant ways as well um, by for example donating to these aid organizations so uh, I guess I'll also say like uh, shout outs to the the uh, deputized like <laughs> guest counselors uh, Pez and Alex Miller and um, thank you to Michael and Simon for, for uh, you know, uh, chatting with us as well. And um, I think that is it for our first console. And uh, it's, this was just really great. So I'm really appreciative of everyone who's participated. And we'll see you again in two weeks. Uh, bye. Bye.